right. Can everyone see a presentation screen? Yes. I see nods. Great. All right, well, uh, nice to see you guys. Um, I'm uh, Carolyn Hicks. I'm a co-founder of Brill Power uh, and uh, head of finance and operations. Um, Brill Power is a spin out from the University of Oxford that focuses on battery intelligence and working to make energy storage uh, more sustainable using a uh, hardware and software intelligence solution. So how did I get here? <laughs> um, well, I, uh, I started in Canada, I'm Canadian. I was born in Toronto uh, before I moved to Saskatchewan, which is kind of the middle uh, of the Western part of Canada. Um, and then growing up, I did synchronous swimming. And, and I mentioned these things because I think we all have an origin and all of these events form uh, where we would like to go and our capabilities when we get there. So I, when I entered studies, I started as a civil engineer. I went to the University of Toronto um, to do my undergrad and then continued uh, doing a research master's degree uh, studying highway work zones. Uh, so this is an actual picture from my research where I got to sit and count, count traffic traveling through work zones and estimate the amount of throughput that could happen with various parameters. When I graduated, I wasn't quite sure what to do. I had a construction management degree, um, but with a focus on transportation. And so at that point, I really had to choose which of the two, uh, my two passions within civil engineering I wanted to pursue and decided to um, move towards the transportation side of things. So I worked for an engineering consulting firm. Um, I worked on, um, transportation planning and this is this is highway seven in Ontario this is a, a stretch of road that I studied to to see what the future would be sort of a 20-year plan for that um, and in that role you know discovered a lot of what I was looking for in a career a lot of the way workplaces worked um, but also what I wasn't looking for and uh, I just discovered that actually being part of something for a brief period of time and not really getting to own what would happen to it beyond the project isn't what I was looking for. So I moved from a consulting firm, which would kind of dip into lots of different projects to the actual owner of the infrastructure assets. So I worked for an organization called Metrolinx. They are in charge of the regional Toronto transportation um, planning and funding of infrastructure. Um, during that time, I became a professional engineer and kind of segued from a world of engineering into transportation economics and um, the social impact of transportation, as well as how is transit paid for. So we did a big study on how to fund transit, and that led me towards infrastructure finance, uh, which is effectively how I came to Oxford. So I decided I wanted to move from my background in engineering into more finance. Um, learned along the way quite a bit about finance, but recognized that there was um, a substantial amount of knowledge missing and that it was a different, difficult career path to, uh, to leap um, and decided to come and study my MBA uh, here at the University of Oxford. Uh, before coming to study here, I did do a brief uh, amount of work at Heathrow Airport. It was quite an exciting time to be there. It was there when Terminal 2 opened, um, when three um, airports that used to be owned by Heathrow were sold and uh, got to learn a, a, quite a crash course in infrastructure finance. And then, you know, my career path at that point in time had sort of followed a series of decisions that, um, you yeah, know, you could never know what the right choice, next right choice would be, but they were relatively logically based on what I had done previously um, until I, I became an entrepreneur. I mean, I think my the plan was to move towards infrastructure finance, um, something that's of course easier to reflect on looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards. Um, but um, you know, when I was doing the MBA, I discovered a whole world of other types of work and types of people doing work in different roles. Um, we did an entrepreneurship project uh, working with my co-founders. And at the end of that year, there was an opportunity to really commit to focusing um, to on Bro Power and on the commercialization of batteries, which um, I hadn't really appreciated just how much goes on inside of a battery pack. 
So here's a, a brief history of Brill Power. So Brill Power started before I was involved with Brill Power. It started with my, my co-founder submitting a paper um, looking at the sustainability of uh, battery packs and battery waste in particular. So um, our CEO, Christoph, he um, looked at how cells degrade over time was what his uh, DPhil was in, um, in the engineering department uh, in Oxford. And um, you know, looked at old battery packs that had been thrown away, cracked them apart and found that half of the cells that are thrown away still have approximately half their capacity in them. And um, our CTO, Damien, our head of data science, Adrian, kind of banged their heads together and said, well, maybe there's a, a better solution. Maybe there's a better way of managing current within a battery pack so that there doesn't create as much waste and it creates a more efficient version of the pack. And so that seed of an idea sort of went through kind of a slow burn as my co-founders uh, finished their DPhils. We applied for a few accelerator programs. So, uh, a couple of patents were submitted while at the university and we received sort of just enough funding at around the point in time when I graduated from the MBA um, that there, would, there was enough evidence that there was opportunity in the idea and in the market and there was enough funding for me to eat. <laughs> and so we um, fo uh, formed the company in 2016, spun up the, from the university in, in 2017 and did the classic startup circuit. So applying for grants, applying for competitions, um, trying to raise funding, trying to figure out what the path, what the right product market fit is, the right path to market. Um, it's sort of all the classic entrepreneurial things that I discussed, but you know, you really, can't fully appreciate until you experience which ones are relevant for your business. So for example, our market uh, energy storage is, is big and growing. And so very rarely do we get questioned on how big our market is. However, it's a hardware product. So how long does it take to commercialize is something is a question that we get lots of, um, is an area where we get lots of questions on. And so I think the, when you, when you, if you Google, you know, what goes in a pitch deck, there's probably a set of 10 slides that you follow. And you know some of them will be a lot easier than others. And each company will need to focus on what's relevant to them. Um, and, and so we sort of, although this slide kind of creates each year as equal, you know, work has just become busier and busier. Our team has grown from four co-founders to sort of six people and then eight people. Now we're 15. Um, we're hiring again, so we should be 22 or 23 by uh, the end of the year. And, um, you know, we're adapting, as everyone is, to the new world of working from home. Um, this is a little photo from our uh, morning team Zoom calls. That's the best 2020 team photo we could get, actually. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, really working towards uh, first product launch uh, and uh, delivering on the projects that we've um, we've we think are going to be essential to commercializing the technology. So what is it that we do? Uh, here's a, a, a brief slide. So we make printed circuit boards. They exist within battery packs and uh, they do um, analysis and diagnostics of what's happening on each series connected module. And that enables us to optimize the way that current flows through the different uh, areas of the pack. And by doing that, you can extend the battery lifetime because the each module will be at the same capacity as opposed to over a PAX lifetime where capacity differences can mean that one uh, cell will degrade faster than another and the pack will be limited by the weakest um, series connected module within the pack. So, you know, our world is batteries, our world is big batteries, um, grid scale storage, electric vehicles, and uh, the aim here is to make energy storage uh, more sustainable, more efficient, and uh, you know, en enable the broader adoption of, of renewables. So you know, everything's easier to remember in threes. <laughs> so I've come up with three, <laughs> three thoughts or things that you may wanna consider if you're looking at uh, a path towards entrepreneurship. Um, and, and the first and, and uh, you know, possibly the most important, um, is finding the right team to found your company with. Um, it's um, extremely difficult. I, I mean, I think for, for, our, for myself, I naturally found this team. We were friends beforehand and we're a good balance of different features 
and we're very much aligned in what we would like to achieve in the company. So you, you don't need to have all those things, but you do need to have people that you can trust and you, you should have people who have a, a similar vision. And it, it can be difficult in the early days to say, well, how much money do you want to make out of this company? When do you want to sell it? Um, do you, would you sell it to these types of companies? And um, just you know, having that assessment at the beginning, it can change, of course, but having it at the beginning will help determine if you're on the same page and maybe, maybe even help define um, where your company's heading. Uh, the next one is um, do something you care about. I mean, this is just absolutely essential for, for me. I mean, for me, the, the amount of work required to start a company is just not worth it if you don't care about it. I mean, it is, um, uh, it occupies your mental space. Oops, I think we've lost Carolyn temporarily. Um. Um, pretty much all the time. <laughs> you know, you go on a holiday, but you're still thinking about it. Oh no, let me know when I'm back. Have I returned? You're back. Okay, very sorry. Um, I, I'm not sure where I left off, but yeah, I was just saying it's, um, it's a lot of work. And I think if you were just in it for the exit and just in it for the money, then um, there would just be, the days would be too difficult, at least in, in my, my point of view. Um, there are some businesses which, which are a quick, quick path to cash. Um, a hardware uh, B2B company is not one of those. Um, usually something that's based on uh, deep tech is, is not one of those. So I, I would say be passionate about what you're doing, whether it's because the tech is so cool that you can't imagine the world not having it, or the impact is so great that you can't imagine the world not having it. But wh whatever it is, you know, you should really care about what you're doing because there will be days when that's, that's pretty much all you have to hang on to. And then finally, and this was the biggest change for me because um, you know, my career path went from you know, engineering to government to infrastructure, which is like big sums of very slow moving finance, um, is that uncertainty. The, the amount of uncertainty that you have when you're an entrepreneur is so significant that over time, I think you forget that it's not normal. Um, and I've discovered this in, in areas of my personal life where um, you know, there's an uncertain outcome for travel or for, you know, are we going to receive something in time? And, you know, I'm just fine with it because, you know, compared to the uncertainty that comes with being an entrepreneur, it's, it's almost, you know, not comparable. Um, and I think alongside that comes resilience. So things are very uncertain. You will find a path through it. Um, and, you know, you can't get caught up on the fact that you can't know what's going to happen. You just need to make the best next step and um, have prepared as best possible for different outcomes. Um, and then I always like to, to put in what it looks like to be an entrepreneur from the outside. So these are um, mostly publicly available photos. These are from speaking events, from um, startup competitions. I mean, like from the outside, what it looks like to be an entrepreneur, it's, it's fantastic. I've been able to meet people and go to places that I never would have done at such an early stage um, in, in my career. I mean, now I'm, um, you know, more than 10 years in, into my career, but even still, I mean, there would be no reason why I would get to meet you know, the Prince of the Netherlands. You know, this sort of kind of a strange um, thing that comes along with being an entrepreneur. You can be quite early stage in your career, but you can get to experience lots of incredible things. This type of thing happens about 1% of the time, probably even less, a fraction of a percent of the time do you get to do things like this. Uh, most of the time you're at your desk eating a meal that looks like this. Um, I've put this in many slides, so I'll see if you had seen it before, but this was both my lunch and my dinner. So this was my dinner version of, of the, my meals that day. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, um, the, the daily, the daily push. And so I decided to lighten it up a little bit because this is what entrepreneurship looks like part one. Um, but this is also what it looks like. So this is, um, the photos of Brill Power over time. So the top left is, um, in the engineering buildings when we signed our spin out documents, 
um, early days towards the left hand side of the page where we were receiving equipment, you know, we were building the whiteboard. <laughs> um, and then you, know, you start having more people on the team. Some, uh, we moved into our own office, uh, you know, we, some of our test suites would run. So that's in the, in the middle on the right there is our firmware team when things work. Uh, in the middle, middle is our hardware team when things work. Um, uh, Christmas parties and of course now, you know, our 2020 uh, Zoom calls. So I, I think it, it really changes over time and what it looks like, but the core motivations and the core features um, remain the same. And I also for this group, you know, maybe you don't want to become an entrepreneur. Maybe you're still deciding. And and I think it's um, if, you know, I think we're all still deciding what we want to do and what we want to be. And and there's, in in particular for those that have overcome challenges to come to where they are today. I mean, I mean, I think we all know the nature of hard work and we all know the nature of accomplishment. Um, and so you end up having a lot of opportunities available to you and it can be paralyzing to decide what you want to do and what direction you want to take. I mean, you can't, you can't really choose wrong, <laughs> to be honest, because you can always change. Of, of course, your path will be influenced with what you've done in the past. Had I chosen to go into construction management instead of transportation, when I finished my master's degree, I probably would have been in a very different place. Would it be better or worse is impossible to know. And, and you know, I can't be bothered to to think about it, you know, I, you, you choose a route um, and you learn things from that and then you just um, keep expecting that the next phase will be better and keep designing it so that it will be. And just coming full circle, um, this is uh, on paper, this is me, you know, I've had these jobs, I've earned these degrees, um, I've had these experiences, uh, but I actually think it's what's more important is where each stage of my career has taught me something. So um, the importance of teamwork, um, I mean, if you've, you've done a team sport, then this is sort of forced on you and this comes a bit more naturally. If you haven't done a team sport, then I, I think, you know, really seek ways where you'll be on a team that will test you because those, the skills that you get from that are essential to pretty much every stage of your career. And then in studying, I mean, yes, I learned critical thinking and problem solving for my engineering degrees, but I also learned how to fail. I was not a very good undergraduate student. Um, it was very difficult. I, I really, <laughs> really love this image, which is, you know, it's, it's not about the failure. It's about how you perceive that failure yourself and how you overcome it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to fail, especially when you expect a lot of yourself. Um, and it takes time to come to terms with how that works. But if you can't fail, then you can't succeed. I mean, you, you have to really be able to um, try things and um, and move on, basically. Um, I think the difference between the undergraduate degree and the master's degree is how to work independently. And I see this with um, people that we've hired. I've seen it with with other colleagues. Is that um, you can you can be a top student. Um, even coming out of an undergraduate degree, um, but things have been relatively structured. You know, you have to take a certain course, you have to submit a certain assignment, and then you get into a workplace where maybe it's quite well structured, but often it isn't. And so um, learning how to guide your work independently, whether it's through um, a, a, a secondary degree or in the early stages of your career is an essential skill to have. Um, not always waiting for your boss or your supervisor to tell you what to do, but saying, I think we're, I think we're going here. I'm going to do this and then, and then check in. Um, and then what was quite eye opening, I think, when I got into the workforce was that um, when I was at the University of Toronto, I was, I, I, I sort of, it felt like my peers were a representative subset of the world, but it's really an odd group. You know, it's, it's really not a representative sample of the people that you'll work with or the people that are in society. It is, it was a group of motivated engineers. Um, and so I think getting into the workplace, you know, you discover that there is a whole world of other people that your place in that workplace is uh, different than what your place was when you were studying. And, um, you know, you, 
I just took the time to understand how that worked and how to best navigate because it, it is is definitely a different different place. Um, and and similarly um, in the this bottom picture of, of managing up, and it's um, that is a forever skill. And even if you don't have a boss, um, even if you're an entrepreneur and you have investors, or even if you're investors and you have um, you know sh shareholders in your investment fund, like somebody always has an expectation of what you should be doing, and managing the expectations of what you're doing is is a skill and takes um takes patience and you know trying one thing and then trying another but i i think this is probably the most um impactful skill that you can have you know you have to think about not just what you want but what does the person you're talking to want and how can you help each other to get to the place where you both would like to be and then, um, you know, doing the MBA with confidence. I mean, I think I met so many other people who were doing all sorts of different things. I got to see where I sat next to them, um, saw other people having incredible skills and abilities that I really wanted to have and had the opportunity to work on those skills myself. And, and I finally just coming back to resilience. So if, if I were to uh, change my CV from here is my timeline of um, experience and um, accomplishments to what have I learned over time. I mean, these are the things that have really prepared me for what I'm doing now and what is preparing me for what I will do next. And I would recommend, you know, don't just focus on what fills your CV, uh, but focus on what you're learning at each step of the way. Um, and don't forget to get things that fill your CV. <laughs> what I would suggest. That's, that's great. Thank you so much, Caroline. Caroline. Um, I'm, I think what I'd like to just quickly suggest to everybody else who's uh, joined us is that you maybe come off um, uh, the, the cam, put the camera on if you possibly can and just introduce who you are and what your background is and then we'll open things up to um, Q&A with Carolyn but just so she knows who else is in the room would be nice. So. Um, I can see Denitza moving around as we speak. So would you like to introduce yourself, Denitza? Unmute. Um, yes. So um, my name is Denitza. Uh, 